Yeah, so I guess we could start, right? Um, Sasha, yeah. are you okay to start? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good to go. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're happy to continue. And uh, with uh, Sasha Zhibawedov from CERN, and he's going to tell us about some forthcoming work uh, on the gravitational reggie bound. Let's take it away. Hi, hi again, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I will be talking about an upcoming work with uh, PhD student uh, Kellyan Herring. Uh, so uh, the, the, the question, well, let's, let's talk about the title a bit. Well, the, I will be talking about gravitational theories. I will be thinking about gravitational scattering in flat space. And uh, Reggie Bounds, so if, uh, if you haven't heard about those, so if you consider say two to two scattering and you take, uh, it's a function of energy and angle uh, or energy and uh, momentum transfer. And so then we will be interested in what happens as you take, if you boost uh, the particles relative to each other and you send it to infinity, what happens to this? This object. So this is what's what's Regi Regi means. So it's a uh, it's a high energy scattering in the in the forward direction. Now, why do you why do we care about this question? So why why is it uh, why is it uh, relevant? Uh, well, uh, the, the the idea is that if you know something about Regi bounds, you can effectively use some um, some basic principles, some basic principles of unitarity, crossing, etc., to to derive interesting consequences. And in part, this is this is interesting. If you if you don't know, uh, for some reason your theory is strongly coupled, or you don't know what is the UV completion, uh, then what you can do is that uh, well, and this is something that people have been doing. Um, Recently, you can they say take this amplitude, uh, integrate it around infinity with some function, and if you if this fun if you know how your amplitude behaves at infinity, so this infinity is s equals infinity. If you know how your amplitude behaves at infinity, you can choose a function accordingly such that it's zero. And then you use some analytic properties of the amplitudes. You, you open the contour. So some pictures that you might have seen is that you have some cuts. You have the Cauchy theorem, say like this. You, you drop the contour at infinity and maybe you, you have something, uh, some theories that you know here. Let me call it IR. And maybe th this piece here, is called the UV because this is the energy direction. And as you know, all our experiments, we don't know it up to infinite energy. Uh, so uh, this is uh, something we don't know. But this equation here, that this is zero, tells you that IR plus UV is equal to zero. And uh, this is a powerful equation because that's a one way we can be productively productively agnostic. So let's say either you work on say swampland versus landscape, and you would like to ask which gravity admits a UV completion. In this case, we are agnostic about the UV. We assume that it's based on basic principles and we want to learn about the IR. Or you know your IR theory, you want to say something about the UV, or we have say QCD, which is strongly coupled. And uh, say even you want to compute uh, magnetic moment of muon, and then there is a light by light scattering, which was a hadronic contribution, which you don't know. So it's really a, a tool. This this kind of dispersion relation. This sort of Cauchy arguments are called dispersion relations. Uh, this is a really a tool which you can use in, in many situations. Even in in the talk by Yes, when she was talking about this reconstructing one loop from a tree level. Secretly, we've been using Lorentzian inversion formula, which also knows about the rate bounds. So it's really just ubiquitous in, in so many, so many ways. And uh, during the last year, many people have been studying what what uh, what's the implication of the sum rules, and I think it's still 
ongoing, ongoing effort. Now in this equation, there are say three ingredients. Uh, one is that uh, usually is IR is what we know. It's your low energy effective field theory. Can be low energy theory of pions, can be general relativity, can be whatever. There is something in the UV. This is the UV completion of the theory of something that we do not know, but we assume that it obeys the basic principles. And um, finally, that this to equal to zero is the statement of the Reggie bound. That's exactly the statement that we can drop this. We can drop this arcs in the limit of S goes to infinity. And this is what this equation means. So in my talk today, I would like to talk about this part, about the Reggie bound. When can we, can we drop these arcs? And as you, can, as you can see that this is a really a tool. Given a certain behavior of the amplitude at infinity, it generates for you this equation. And uh, the better your function is behaved, the more equations you get. The more sum rules we get, the more sum rules we get, the more thing we can learn about the UV from the IR or about the IR from the UV. So that's why it's important to really understand uh, uh, what is the regi bound, because in a sense, each regi bound gives us a, an improvement in regi bound, gives us new equations, new non perturbative equations that we can study. And um, in, uh, in the 60s, People have thought a lot about this. In fact, when they say the whole S matrix bootstrap started, this was the idea that we can solve the theory by, by taking basic principles and adding to it a little bit at infinity. Uh, but in any case, people uh, re studied these questions. So what is the Reggie bound of the amplitudes and the gap theories when, you, when your theory has a mass? And this is probably one of the, like, the central fact that you should remember that came out of S matrix theory is this, that if you take any quantum field theory, which is gapped and you consider scattering at uh, high energies for momentum less than some positive number. And this positive number depends on the details of the theory, but say you given a theory, you can compute it. Say for scattering of pions, it will be four M pi square. Your amplitude in the complex plane, when divided by S square, when S sense goes to infinity, is zero. So this is a, a very important fact. And uh, this is sometimes stated as in quantum field theory, dispersion relations uh, require two subtractions. This two means this number two. And uh, this is a completely universal fact. So I think it's good to remember it because uh, you can apply it over and over again. Now, the question is, what happens to this story, to this equation when you add gravity? So this is a question uh, that I will address in my talk. And uh, by gravity, I mean simply that the spectrum has a massless spin two particle at this level. Now, uh, so this is what I will try to answer in this talk. To remind you, there is, well, this is one famous equation from the S matrix bootstrap uh, to give it some meat to these words that it's important as the theory is get. Let me review briefly something, another one of the most famous results, which is the Frosser bound. And it's a bound on the uh, total cross section, growth of the total cross -se section in any gap theory. So uh, I will be brief. So if you cannot follow some details, I will some, come back to it. but. I hope to just give you some, some feeling what's going on. So the total cross section uh, for my purpose, it's imaginary part of a amplitude in the forward limits, the momentum cross uh, is zero. And uh, this formula is a so-called partial wave expansion. You can expand amplitudes in partial waves. It's a sum over spins. So it's an angular momentum basis. And to derive a frost R bound, you do the following thing. You take this sum over all spins, and split it into two parts. Here at this moment, this G star is arbitrary cutoff. So just whatever. And then you use non-perturbative unitarity, to, which tells you that this partial waste, it's like probability, it's less than one in some units. So you can bound the sum 
just by spin square. Spin square comes here from this J and then J star. And for the high spin part, this is really where you use a gap. And uh, this, now again, after a lot of work, people figure out, so there is a first, there was a um, um, lemon ellipse and some analyticity domain. And then there was a famous Martin's extension of analyticity domain, which effectively for the purpose of here tells you that if you take the momentum transfer, say even positive and less um, say four M squared, it's a two particle threshold. You take imaginary part of this thing, you divide it by some polynomial, some S to the power, there is such N that this thing is less than infinity. So this is a non-trivial fact. And you know, if, if I give you a quantum field theory to show that uh, it, it requires some work, but the important point is that here, this four M square is a positive number and, this, and it has M here. And then if you combine these two elements and you combine, again, you write a partial wave expansion for this imaginary part, you use some properties of Legendre polynomials you uh, de derive the following bound. So J square for low spin and something which is exponentially suppressed in the J star for high spin. You see that this constant A N enters here. So that's why we secretly used it to, to derive this formula. There is some S to the N here. And now you just uh, extremize this formula with respect to J star. You find that it's this and that you get the Frosser bound. So that's how Frosser bound is, de is derived. And uh, the crucial input is unitarity and extended analyticity, which for my purposes is this formula. Now, what happens is that, as, as you see in gravity, this number M goes to zero. And if you said this number M here goes to zero, this exponential suppression is gone. It just becomes one. And the whole argument collapses. And so uh, in the absence of the mass gap, we do not have an extended analyticity. Therefore, the same method for the large spin partial wave estimate does not work. And that's the reason why you haven't heard about the Frosar bound for gravity in, in, in the books. Now, in fact, to, to do that, to, to, to address this problem, let's remember the simple fact that in fact, uh, this high spin physics, it might be, you can say it's a, it might be a boring physics. Why? Because uh, if you consider scattering of wave packets, which are separated by distance B, this is an impact parameter. This uh, impact parameter related to spin like this. And so when you take uh, J to be very large, B becomes very large. Uh, and so as things become very large, okay, then the objects stop interacting, they cluster effectively, interaction drops. And so uh, the, the basic picture is that large spins are related to large impact parameters. And at large impact parameters, the physics becomes familiar. So we have gra gravitational, uh, we have Newton's potential, we have maybe emission of gravity waves, so it is a familiar physics. So it feels like we should be able to put such bound. Now, slightly subtle thing here. Remember for the radial limit, we also take S to infinity. So we have to, there is some interplay and we should be uh, careful with that. So the, the part of the talk is uh, as follows. I will derive uh, three bounds. First is asymptotic bound point-wise when this momentum T is fixed. Second, we consider smeared amplitudes when we integrate it against some function in the transferred momentum. And this is inspired by this recent work by Simon Caronio, Dalimil Mazak, Leonardo Rostel, and David Simmons Duffin. And finally, when we do the experiments in the lab, the energy is never infinite. The energy is always finite. So it's also useful to try to derive local bounds on the growth of an amplitude. So if you do the experiment at some energy, how quickly the amplitude can grow? So this all, these are the three questions. So uh, the basic idea will be to use, uh, to combine the basic principles to what we know from the large impact parameters. And uh, let me state the assumptions, because I think it's also in the literature, people often 
uh, these days use some uh, assumptions about the regge bound, but somehow they were not spelled out very clearly. So I will consider for this talk, mostly when we talk about gravity, scatter, two to two scattering in D larger than five. The reason why it's D larger than five is because in D equal to four, the asymptotic states are not free particles. So one has to uh, develop this analysis further, and this is an open problem in the field. So the results I will be saying, they, they do apply to the scattering in four dimensions, but the theory is gap, so something like QCD. Um, now, the basic assumptions are that first, but let's focus on gravity in D larger than five, then we do have amplitudes. We do not have any infrared divergences. Asymptotic states are just free particles. This is what we assume. And the first assumption is that dynamics is described by unitary asymmetrics, which characterize transitions between asymptotic states and the asymptotic states given by a set of free stable particles. The second thing that we assume is that the amplitude is analytic in upper half plane. Again, this is something which has been rigorously derived in quantum field theory. Um, in gravity, this is something that believed to be correct. Uh, uh, there are some uh, theories, perturbatively, some S matrices that violated the so-called Lee weak S matrices, but non-perturbatively, I think uh, this is what we will assume. And this is believed to, this is related to causality in general. The same thing, what we will, the similar, similarly, a related assumption is a sub-exponential growth in the in the upper half plane. So we will assume that the amplitude uh, grows slower than this function. And again, uh, this is uh, in, in the setting set uh, uh, that we understand this is related to causality. However, say completely clean rigorous proof in gravity we do not have, but this is something that everyone I think assumes. So this is uh, two things. Now, finally, we will assume crossing, which is that if you have this STU and uh, you have a scattering in one channel, uh, you know this picture again, if you take the S plane, you have cuts. So here you have scattering AB to AB. You go in upper half plane where you know it on this cut. You have a, a scattering of B bar, A to B bar, A to B bar, where B bar is an antiparticle. So again, this is a completely standard thing. Uh, so that's what, what's the picture we have. We have a function analytic in upper half plane and uh, with and two cuts, it describes physical scattering. The technical assumption, I will assume that the scattering amplitude is a function of S and T. Uh, in principle, it's a distribution, which means, and, but this is again, something everyone usually assumes. And the idea is that everything I say, one can say rigorously for distributions, but it will be true on average, you, you average a little bit. Now, these basic assumptions are still not enough to derive the regge bound. Uh, you need to have more, and this more is related to bounding the higher spins. And this is what, uh, let me call a gravitational clustering. It's a statement that at large impact parameters, scattering is described by low energy gravitational EFT, namely GR. So I will be more, more precise about what it means, but this is a simple intuition. Even if you take energy to be 1 billion M Planck, if you remove uh, your objects far enough, the interaction will, come, will become weak. So what's the strategy of the argument? It's very simple. We take the upper half plane. So here I assume an electricity everywhere, say here. Along the real axis, the scattering is described as physics, physical scattering. So here we will use a bounding unitarity and crossing. So here it's unitarity, here unitarity is crossing. Along the direction C, we use a, this assumption of sub-exponential growth. And then we apply the maximum modulus principle in the upper half plane, which is known as the pragman lindelof um, That's a basic idea. So you bound amplitude here, you bound amplitude here. And if we assume sub-exponential growth here, then the amplitude is bounded everywhere in the upper half plane by its value on the, on the real axis. So the task, the other task will be, therefore, to bound the gravitational scattering on this axis. Now, let me uh, remind you some basics uh, 
of the unitarity, which will be important for us. Well, as I said already, you take an amplitude, you can decompose it into a set of partial waves, Fj, and Pj are Legendre polynomials. This is your, you can uh, you can do. And unitarity is simply state is a statement that if you have this combination of one which describes no scattering, plus this partial wave which describes scattering, then the probability is less than one. So on, whenever it describes physical scattering, so four and squared is a two particle threshold. Um, now, when does this formula make sense? When does the sum converges? And you might worry that it's not always convergent because of the following fact. If you take an amplitude, an even non-perturbative amplitude, and you take t to zero, you, you will encounter graviton pole. Now, graviton pole, if you re rewrite it in terms of the angles, it behaves like one minus cos. So it's divergent, you have a pole, and so you might worry that this sum actually won't converge always. And it's true that it converges only for fixed t in d larger than five. And it converges as a distribution in d less or equals than five. As a distribution, I mean, you smear a little bit in, the, in terms of t, you, you average a little bit, and then it starts converging. But point wise, it doesn't. So this is just kinematics. This is non perturbative unitarity. This is what we assume. The same, uh, so we will consider smeared amplitudes. You take an amplitude, you integrate it against some function. Uh, I will label it by A and B, which describes how quickly it decays close to the boundaries. And um, it doesn't matter. And so you have to set A to be strictly positive because of the graviton pole, which behaves as one over Q square. There is a Q here, which cancels one of the Qs. And so for this integral to exist, you need A to take to be strictly positive. And so then uh, you can ask, well, what about this average amplitude? Does it uh, admit the expansion like that where I take averaging from the outside the sum to inside of the sum? This is something which is called swapping. And uh, the fact that you can commute averaging in the sum is a swapping condition as was discussed in, in, in the context of conformal bootstrap, this paper. And here you can show that yes, yes it, can be, it can be swapped. So this operation is swappable. So uh, the amplitude admits this expansion. Finally, to, to make it a little bit at this point, again, as I already said, um, uh, we will think to organize the sum over spins in, 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 some, in, term, in terms of some physics, we, we need to have some physical intuition and the physical intuition comes from this formula which organizes variance, various Gs in terms of the scattering at various impact parameters. Now, the key, really the key starting point for our analysis is a series of work. Well, it started by Tooth, but then there was a series of work by Amati Cefaloni in Veneziano in the beginning of 90s, who analyzed uh, gravitational scattering at large energies and impact parameters, and they identified different physical regimes. So what do I mean by that? Let's say you take S some energy to be large and fixed, and you increase impact parameters. So as it goes with your intuition, as you go very, very far, you just have three level exchange, so-called born, described by S square over T by analog of relativistic Newton's potential. But as you go to smaller B, this region stops when S uh, when B becomes of order S over one over D minus four. This is just to say that if you scatter things at higher at higher energies, you have to set them further and further apart uh, for them to interact quickly. Then, uh, as you cross this uh, cross this region, the physical scattering is believed and was derived in some cases. Uh, to describe by this iconal phase, uh, which we also discussed a bit in the previous talk. Uh, so the interaction uh, is uh, not weak in the, term, in the sense that the phase shift is weak. In this, uh, in, the, in this impact parameter, uh, I went from the sum over j's to the integrals over b's. And this f's using unitarity became this phase shift. And so this phase shift in the iconal region is not small. However, we still 
know what this formula is and it's ca it's capturing a simple physics of propagation of two particles in this uh, shockwave background it's still mostly elastic uh, particles just deflect a bit and uh, delay Shapiro delay a bit so this region continues uh, up to s to one over d minus two and at this point you enter the inelastic inelastic effects become uh, important and uh, well, there are three main types we can discuss. Tidal, this is, for example, in the string theory, your graviton turns into a string mode in the gravitational field of the other particle. You can start emitting gravity waves. And finally, you start forming black holes. So all these three, three regimes will be uh, will play some role in my talk. So, uh, and the scaling was has worked out by, uh, by ACV. Uh, and uh, well, this is just Schwarzschild radius. Uh, this is when the gravity waves emission become important and this is tidal. And one thing, uh, one basic result is that when D is larger than five, then the leading inelasticity comes from tidal effects. Effectively, when D is less or equal than five, the leading elasticity comes from the emission of gravity waves. That's just how things are in, in, in gravity. So Let's now derive a bound on the regular limit in, in a gravitational theory using this picture. And uh, you see here, depending on how much input you take, let's say you're very skeptical of this picture. You believe that iconal does not make sense. Uh, it only, only born makes sense. So then, okay, fine. You can take this picture and trust it only to the right from it. If you say, okay, iconal, I, I believe in the iconal, you can trust it further. If you think in your theory, you even control it further, you can go further and the further you can go, the, the more stringent bound you can derive. So let me be first very conservative and assume uh, assume just this born. How do we do? Well, we do exactly the same thing as we did for frost R bound. We split the sum into low spin and high spin. Then we use uh, this lemma for D-dimensional gender polynomials. Curiously, we, we haven't proved it, uh, we checked it in a high spin limit and uh, we checked it for uh, numerically. Uh, mathematicians only proved this for D less than five. At least we couldn't find any proof of that, but this is an important lemma. So just a kinematic statement about properties of Legendre polynomials. And then, uh, well, what you do is that let me go the low spins. You start from the sum. You want to bound it from above. You put absolute values on partial waves on Legendre. Partial waves you use non-perturbative unitarity, which pulls out this factor. And for PJs, you use the lemma. That's it. We are done. This is a bound on the uh, on this uh, low spins. Uh, this of order S piece is related to this one here. It comes from this one, and this piece comes from this thing. So this was simple. Well, this was unitarity. Now let's go to high spin. Well, first of all, we have to define what do we mean exactly by, by this gravitational clustering. And the way we define it is say, well, what is the tree level interaction between two particles? What you do at the, if you do the tree level GR computation, this is given by this. And let's say we say that it's equal to epsilon, which is, I don't know, 10 to the one, 10 to the minus 100. It's a very small number. So then the interaction is really tiny. And what we believe is that when spin becomes larger than that, these partial waves are bounded by the tree level result. This is very, very conservative. We already here, we just described by tree level GR. And so we are saying as we increase spin interaction becomes only, only weaker, this formula holds. Well, then you plug it in your formula, you use this bound on FJ, and you use a bound on Legendre, so you derive a bound, you extremize over J star as we did for the frost star bound, and here you go, we derived a very, very conservative bound on the uh, behavior of the scattering amplitude in, uh, in gravitational theory, that uh, it was the, the sums were convergent for D larger than seven here. So uh, the statement is then from these assumptions, we see that, uh, and, uh, that the amplitude cannot grow faster than that. And uh, we use it for the S channel. Remember, for the U channel, we use crossing. It's the same thing. In the upper half plane, we use uh, we use a sub-exponential growth. So this is a true bound everywhere. Now, uh, 
that's that's a conclusion. That's what I just said. Now let's improve it a bit. Let's be not so so conservative. So first of all, you can say that not it's just bounded by by for j larger than j born. It's not just bounded by uh, um, this behavior. It's actually captured by it. So it's we can plug this Fj. It's a it's a good approximation, and then we get the same formula. Uh, but now it will converge for d larger than five. And uh, if you think of this formula as a distribution, actually, this will work for d larger than equals than five. It will not work for d equal four because the amplitudes do not make sense there. One has to define proper observables. So now let's improve a little bit more. This is still very conservative because while we believe that at high energies, GR perfectly captures the scattering in a Axelbrook-Sexel shockwave background. So let's just put this in. And here, what we do is again, we say we have an iconal scattering. Then let's say there is some mechanism at some scale M, which can be a string scale uh, where inelasticity starts. Uh, the scaling with impact parameters again known. It's very simple. And let's assume that this is equal to some epsilon. And let's we can set epsilon to 10 to the 1 minus 1000. So inelasticity is really tiny. So then uh, we let's assume that above the scale, the amplitude is captured by iconal. So we take a tree level scattering and put it in the, in the phase shift. Again, remember that this B title we chose is really, really big. And the uh, inelasticity is really, really small. So in including here's corrections does not change the leading behavior. It's really small. And now you can, again, estimate this behavior, extremize, and you get this bound. So uh, this bound, we believe it is, in fact, this is a true bound. It holds in, in any gravitational theory. And it is uh, saturated and just because that at large energies, this simple iconal saturates this bound. So you see again, what's important here, it's two minus some number, which is positive. Uh, here it's d larger than five. If you want to d equal five, you have to do two things. You have to first remember that it's a distribution, but you can smear it a little bit, so it doesn't matter. But the second thing you have to remember is that in this case, the relevant scale is not the tidal scale, but it's a scale where you start emitting gravity waves. So, uh, but this again, it's a minor contribution. And the first summary I want to tell you is, is just that. Um, with this, a simple assumptions, which um, I spelled out very explicitly, uh, gravitational amplitudes admit dispersion relations with two subtractions. So that's the first statement. So T is negative here, which is a physical T. D is larger than equal than five, but they always decay uh, faster than that. And here, when, 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 when writing this, I use this model not with born, but with an iconal. So um, that's, uh, that's a statement. Now, uh, yeah, maybe I should stop for questions. But we also can have a discussion after, as, as you like. So okay, maybe, if you, yeah, I, need, if you, I need just a, yeah. another comment on equal four. <laughs> Uh, case you said this results up to the d equal four case. Did you say this at the beginning? I said it's d equal four in the gap theories. Okay. In the gap theories, when the, because when theory is gap, then the scattering amplitude is asymptotic states are free particles, and then everything I said uh, it yeah. makes sense. But if we want to talk about gravity or even electromagnetism, we have to define asymptotic states properly. And I guess we all, we all believe that there is analogous statements, but no one has, so far at least, uh, spelled it out carefully and systematically. So this is an excellent problem to, to everyone. So now, Sasha, uh, yeah. can I quickly ask a question? So uh, you showed bounds which are actually stronger than this equation, right? Like Sorry? you have two. So you showed bounds above which is stronger than this box equation, like you have two minus some number. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yes, yes. And this number kind of depended on what exactly did you assume about this uh, large scheme? That's right, yeah. And, yeah. and you did this for gravitational theory. And I was just wondering, 
is there something like can you get make this number better also in uh, theories without guys and just gap theories like using some similar yes so ideas? yeah that's uh, that's uh, that's an excellent question so in fact uh, there is something uh, some argument physical argument to derive a frost are bound in gap theories which is very similar in spirit but then you assume that uh, you have the phase shift at large impact parameters well we have a gap so therefore we have you cover potential which is the gap times b and here you put some s uh, s to the n so this is if you assume that at large impact parameters this is a this is a relevant behavior you get immediately frost are bound and then you can try to um, uh, to improve it, but the first statement is that we don't know what is n in this formula. But again, based on causality, it's 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 natural to assume that this n is never larger than one. But if we put even n larger than one or equal than one, in fact, for any n positive, we will get a Froissart bound, which effectively comes from this fact that when this becomes the photo one. It's B of four log S. Now, but what will what will depend is that it, there will be n here, just from the fact that we solve it to one. It will be n over log n times log S. And so, if we know something about this n, for example, if we know in uh, in I don't know in uh, say QCD at the moment we see the cross sections rise with n equal zero point zero eight. So then we will get the frost are bound with this coefficient here, which will be a function of n, and so then we will improve. But um, but the log log square s will not improve. So that's uh, the picture in the gap theories. I think log square will be pretty universal. We expect, and um, here, well, if n is positive, we get log square. If you know that in your theory, for example, n is const, n is zero or even less than zero, then we, we can improve. Then we will not have frost our bound because uh, the phase shift will not grow with energy and this scaling will not be relevant. So in principle, I think the same argument can be used, uh, can be used for gap theories, but I, I, it requires again, some input about knowing physics at large impact parameters it requires knowing this. And uh, I haven't seen it analyzed. Great, thanks a lot, it's very clear. Okay, so this is a that's a punchline number one. Now let's move to the smear amplitudes. Why is it a different problem? That's a diff, slightly different problem because remember I told you that no matter how large s you take, if you take t to zero, we always have s square over t. So you have s square here, and here remember you see that all the amplitudes decays with the s square. So if we smear t all over to zero. There is an interplay in between taking s large and spearing all the way up to zero, so we have to reanalyze. So, but the idea is the same. We take a smear amplitude, we split it into slow spin, high spin. For low spin, we use another lemma. Again, we don't prove it. We observe it. At, we derive it at large spin. We observe it numerically. We believe it's correct. And uh, then, for the um, s channel, everything goes. It's essentially the same, I will not go through it, but there is an important subtlety in the U channel. Remember when T is, uh, uh, what happens is that if you look at the U channel, the amplitude is uh, fixed S. And if you apply crossing, you see that uh, for the, well, when you do not smear here, nothing happens. You still have partial waves times Legendre's. You can apply lemma one. But if you have smearing, the smearing now acts not just on Legendre polynomials that was before. So remember that when we smeared before, the, the formula was, um, oh, it's uh, where it was, sorry. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have started it, but yeah. So this formula, it's important that smearing only act on Legendre in the S channel. This is not touched. That's how we designed it. Now, if you go to the U channel, this is lost uh, because by crossing, your smearing only also acts on the on the partial waves, and that's why you cannot apply this lemma. You have to work a little bit hard, 
Um, and um, if you work a little bit hard again, you put absolute values, you get now absolute value of Legendre. You can use lemma one and lemma two to prove another little lemma. And uh, the punchline is that you still get the bounds. So you get the same as a, uh, this are the bounds and the different models. So in a born, you get the same number, but now you have another factor A, which remember was related to the behavior of the smearing function close to Q equals zero, where you have a graviton pole. So you have Q to the A here. So, uh, uh, and this is a manifestation of exactly this interplay. When you take Q to zero, the amplitude behaves like S square. And so uh, this A eventually makes it into the rigid bounds. So these numbers, again, you can compute for D larger than five. The tidal physics is important for uh, D equal five. You have to take care of gra gravity waves, but the punchline is, uh, uh, is the same, that uh, if you take a smearing function, it admits, the amplitude admits dispersion relations with two subtractions in D larger equals than five. So at this point, uh, what I told you is that the fact that the scattering amplitudes have dispersion relation with two subtractions is not only true in uh, gap theories, but also true in gravitational theories, both for smeared amplitudes and for, um, for point-wise bounds. And as we slide, have a slight discussion, in principle, if you want, you have a slightly stronger bound here, uh, you know, precisely the power. Now I will proceed and in the last part of my talk, start with the twice subtracted dispersion relations, since we believe they play a fundamental role and I explain just why. And uh, we will try to see what are the consequences of them for the rigid behavior as well. And I'll focus on two examples. It's a gravity in D large than five and say hadron scattering of QCD in four dimensions. So first of all, statement number one, if you start with twice subtracted distortion relations and you put some extra condition on the smearing, and again, this was just to reiterate again and again, we smear over the transferred momentum from zero to Q naught, some Q, some psi function AB, and close to zero, it behaves like Q to the A and close to Q naught, it behaves as Q naught, Q naught minus Q to the B. So if you choose this smearing factor is larger than something, and you plug this in a twice subtracted dispersion relation, you show that in fact, the amplitude cannot grow faster than linear. And the physical picture is that uh, by increasing smearing, the way it's just developed is that these numbers, uh, they suppress this large spin contribution. So this is just a kinematical fact. So the picture is that if we make A and B large enough, we start being dominated by low spins and low spins, we can just uh, bound by unitarity to be linear in S. And why do we need a twice subtracted dispersion relation? Because it allows us to improve the U-channel estimate. Remember there was this problem that our smearing acts both on the partial wave and, and on PJ, so we cannot apply the lemma but now when we, in dispersion relations, when we write amplitude as a, with two subtraction as an integral over cuts, now we have a second integral over S prime. And so we can change the variables and uh, do a little bit of algebra. So we can decouple two smearings and apply a better estimate to our U channel cut. So, okay, that's, a, that's an interesting statement. Again, this is true in um, both in gap theories or in gapless theories. This is a universal fact that in fact, if you do enough smearing, then it's less or equals an S. Now let's do a little bit more. Um, let's assume that this bound is saturated. And in fact, we believe that it is in many theories. It's, it's just, uh, well, I will comment on that. So let's assume that it's saturated this bound. Then we will get the Ponder and Chuk theorem, which says that, uh, the, cross the smeared cross sections are equal for scattering of say proton proton and proton antiproton. But here, uh, I think in the usual statement of Pomeranian Chuk theorem, uh, you need to make some extra assumptions, which is this. Uh, however, here we believe that this is generic because it comes from, from low, low spins. 
And uh, the way you derive this theorem is that if you assume this linear behavior, and this is exactly how I guess Pomeranchuk did it, and you plug it in a twice subtracted dispersion relation, uh, they get the term, you generate term S log S, which, uh, which violates your original assumption that this has to cancel. So basically it, it's just uh, your amplitude behave everywhere in the upper half plane with the same number. So you have some numbers C times S everywhere in the upper half plane. You go here, you get one contribution. You get, uh, you get the same C here, here. And so you get the Pomeranchuk theorem uh, both if you include gravity or not. So that's uh, somehow if, if you smear the amplitude, that's a much more general result. Now, uh, in my discussions uh, about classical physics, we, we use that GR becomes quickly coupled at uh, large distances, as we know, uh, but we also know something else. If we scatter two particles at very high energies and low impact parameters, then they form a trapped surface and form a black hole with essentially probability one. We haven't used that yet. So let's use that. Let's use this fact that we form black holes. And uh, this is simply a statement is that if we have this impact parameter B less than of uh, order Schwarzschild radius, then we form a black hole with a probability one. For the elastic amplitude, it, it implies that it's zero. Elastic amplitude is zero, so because it's very, the, the probability to collide at huge energy and do not form a black hole becomes zero effectively. In fact, in the literature, people like this estimate that it becomes uh, order e to the minus uh, entropy of a black hole for these impact parameters, but we don't need it. Just zero is enough, that's leading. So then, in fact, uh, this is also uh, believed to be true in uh, QCD, or at least this is consistent with everything we know. This is something known as the black disk model. And this just statement that at small enough impact parameters, the uh, total, the, 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 the absorption is total. And uh, well, here in gravity, you have Schwarzschild radius and the QCD, it's believed to have log S behavior. So the, the, the black disk is of size log S. Now at the level of partial waves, it means that they all become purely imaginary. So it's, so this formula is the same as this formula. It's just some change of variables. And then in fact, you realize that if you put some condition in the smearing, you can compute this linear asymptotic. So I told you that the, uh, the, the amplitude is, cannot grow faster than linear. So in fact, you can try to compute this number. And the idea is that if you choose this A and B larger than D minus four, and b larger than d minus three square. This is some condition on the smearing. All the contributions of large spins, which is non-universal, all the contribution which comes from point like scattering of low spin, it is manifestly sublinear. It does not grow as s. So it is it is little o of s. The only contribution that is linear in s comes from scattering at impact fixed impact parameters. And uh, well, since this guy grows with S, goes to infinity, uh, when we take S to infinity, we, we, we can estimate, uh, in fact, just take the sum from G, J from zero to infinity and put this black hole ansatz or black disk ansatz. Again, this black ansatz is not correct everywhere. It's only correct here. But the point is that no matter what you write in the region away from, from this, it will be subleading, it will not contribute to C. So therefore equally, you can just put this black hole ansatz everywhere. And uh, what you get is zero. So if you compute the sum, you get zero. So the statement that in fact, if you take twice subtracted dispersion relation, you take into account black hole production, uh, the numbers of subtraction is not two, but it becomes one. And the same is expected to hold in QCD for scattering of hadrons. So this is something which, uh, which might be interesting to explore. Uh, this sum rule, uh, which comes from just one subtraction. Now in the last part of my talk, I want to discuss the following question. Every physical experiment has performed at finite energies. 
it is therefore interesting to ask what is the bound on the local growth of the amplitude? Not at some asymptotic energies, but the local growth. Now, in the literature, there is a long story of various discussions about what is uh, the, the bounds, various conjectures. So long story short, I think it basically reduces to the fact that the intuition that the amplitudes cannot grow locally faster than S squared. Not asymptotically, but you go to some finite energy and it never grows faster than a square. That's, I think, uh, that's, I think, we what we, we believe is true and it's supported by various arguments. And in fact, uh, you can ask, okay, now that we have this twice subtracted dispersion relation, can we derive it from here? And there was in a paper by Simon, a toy model for this, which didn't quite work. Uh, but you can make it work. And so the precise statement is the following. If you take a local S naught and you take IY and you take imaginary part of T S naught plus IY and you take its logarithmic derivative with respect to Y, it's between one and minus three. So let me just elaborate a bit. Imagine that your amplitude locally behaves as lambda S to the J. So as a pure power. You plug it then in this formula, you get that J is less or equal than two absolute value. It's the same as, uh, it's really, it's the same as bound on chaos and ADS. And if J is equals to two, this is, uh, so this is, a, if, if it behaves like in gravity, then lambda is, uh, has to be positive. This was a bit schematic. So let me give you some, some details. What exactly do we do? Well, first, something we discussed with Amit, if we take the uh, take the massive theory like large NQCD, let's take large NQCD, and again the picture you see the picture is the following. Let's say let's say we have large NQCD, we have a non-perturbative amplitude, non-perturbative amplitude uh, satisfies twice subtracted dispersion relations. But then we look at say low energies, and the amplitude if n is large is equal approximately to the tree level amplitude plus small corrections. So the local behavior, the local behavior of the amplitude is the same as evaluating tree level or planar contribution to large NQCD. And here again, you just take, uh, you just take a twice subtracted dispersion relation and you explicitly find uh, that if you take this logarithmic derivative, it's between uh, zero and minus four and this implies uh, the previous bound. So here we use unitarity for the imaginary part and here you just find the positive combinations. So this, the, the conclusion of this is that if you take a leading range trajectory in large NQCD uh, for J of T, where T is between zero and M gap, it's bounded by two. Now, this doesn't quite work in gravity because as we discussed several times, this region does not exist in gravity. We have polar T equals zero and uh, we do not have this positivity here. So what we do for, for gravity, we do smearing. So we try to find the smearing such that uh, this thing is satisfied. A priori, it's not obvious that such smearing exists. So we looked and we found that it does. And again, say in D equal four, this would be local bound on the say average hadron cross section. You can choose this functional and uh, find a region in the, energy plane where it is satisfied. And for D larger than five, uh, I think it's a scalar uh, version of the CRG conjecture, the, this statement, scalar because then consider scattering on scalars. You can take this function on, you find uh, that, uh, that it is uh, positive. So again, here, this is a plot. This is what we did. Uh, we, we tried to find this functional to show that this bound is satisfied by checking its positivity on the imaginary part. So this is, a, this is a region in the complex energy plane where the bound is satisfied. This is some variance technical details. It's not relevant uh, in any case. So this bound holds in some region and uh, we can find this region. The same is true in uh, gravitational theories in D larger than five. You find the region in the complex energy plane where again, uh, this bound is satisfied. Finally, just to do some, in all my talks so far, there were no examples. So let me give you one. 
So take Verasoro Shapiro, take a four dealer on scattering in type 2B or in type 2 string theory. And uh, well, this is what it is. Uh, then there is some technical details. You have to add some subtraction here, but note that at large S, it goes like a constant. So it is not affecting anything. And uh, the basic picture is that it has to be less than S square. And here you see the blue region, it's where uh, we proved that it has to be, say, less than in some units, less than one or less than two, this power. And here the dots are coming from Verasoro Shapiro. So here in the region outside, you see it starts violating. So here it becomes uh, more larger than one. But here, everywhere you would expect, indeed, consistent with all our findings, it is less than one. And you can do a contour a plot also. You see what happens. So this is one. So here, Verasoro Shapiro grows faster than a square. But the region where we proved that it has to go slower is here. And if you already go from 1 to 0 0.98, you see you go inside this region. So it's really uh, it's really tight. If you go from 1 to 0 0.98, you will already violate. You will already enter this region. OK, so let me conclude. So I will conclude in terms of very small numbers. First, number two played an important role in my talk. And remember, it's a number of subtractions in dispersion relations, both in quantum field theory and in gravity. And it's also maximal power of the local growth of an amplitude. So whatever your effective field theory is, if you measure the amplitude locally, it will not grow faster than a square. And this is related to causality. Then there was a number one played in my role. And this is a number of subtractions in, in dispersion relations in theories with strong absorptions of high energy and fixed impact parameter. So this is true in gravity. And we believe it's, well, it's believed to also be true in QCD. Well, then there was spin zero because I considered spinless particles and it would be very interesting to include particles with non-zero spin, uh, scattering of gravitons, the same techniques should work. And also, we consider the cosmological constant to be zero. Eventually, of course, we want it to be positive. And uh, I guess we believe that the right principle is that there are no time machines in AFT. We should not be able to build a time machine, whether it's in the seat or in flat space, in ADS. So we know we know one principle. Uh, I guess um, I, learned, I learned from a paper by Andrew and Claudia that Hawking has this uh, chronology protection principle. Which, which is essentially the same, my understanding. Um, so uh, yeah, I think uh, it's still to be understood what precisely, how to translate this abstract words into precise formulas and in flat space and in ADS, we, we know how to do it to some extent, but in the sitter, it's an open problem. So it's an important thing to remember. And finally, uh, the most uh, important number is four, of course, and then we have to generalize the gravity in four dimensions. So I think this is homework for everyone. And uh, yes, even though it feels like in infrared dynamics is solvable and it should be easy, somehow combining these ideas of uh, non perturbative constraints from unitarity and crossing with this infrared dynamics is still tricky and we still it still hasn't been done so eventually when when this is understood uh, we will can take standard model couple to gr and run these bounds and try to see what we can say uh, about the uv so this would be the the ultimate goal i think but we are not there yet thank you thank you very much Alexander, Sasha. And if there are questions or comments, now is the time. Could you elaborate on the decider comment? Uh, or is yes. it just, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, well, this is a, that's a, there's a problem is that something that I don't know how to, yeah, so the, the idea is that, um, so here we're talking about dispersion relations and we use all these UV things, but that's all good. We know that physically one thing that we want to impose is that let's say I give you a piece of space time 
and I give you some effective field theory in it, then in principle, there is a complete set of experiments we can run. And this complete set of experiments should not produce, say, time machines. So we should not be able to construct a time machine within EFT. And I think uh, whenever we can combine this principle with some dispersion relations, we tend to get similar results. So if, you, if, you, if, you, if you're able to build a time machine, then you run dispersion relations, you find that this EFT is not consistent with dispersion relations. But somehow this time machine argument is a bit vague. Uh, so in flat space and ADS, we can use the, 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 the rigorous things. Now in the theater, we do not have, we do not have dispersion relations. Uh, we do not have this, uh, this picture, but the, the principle should still hold, uh, I, I believe. This is, a, if I take a chunk of this, this theater with some effective field theory in it, um, then uh, we should not be able uh, to build a, a time machine. In it. Uh, now, there was a one concrete proposal, I guess, in a recent paper by, um, by Simon, uh, David, uh, Julio, and Jungji. Sorry, I don't know the, the, I'm not sure the last name. And uh, their proposal is well, you derive the bound in R ADS. So, in, in, in D equal four, we can do ADS four. You go to ADS four, you derive all your bounds. So, let's do standard model plus GR in ADS four. And at the end of the computation, we do the magic trick and change our ADS to RDS. So this magic trick is also what's called in some papers quasi-bound. So now uh, it's probably a reasonable thing to do. It's maybe a good guess, especially if the cosmological constant is small. Um, yeah, because there is a history in the literature when people derive something in ADS and in the last page, they just say the same is true in DS if you do this change. <laughs> so, so if we believe that this, this, this is uh, the right thing to do, then uh, that's one, one strategy that maybe we should just- Could add it. another homework problem to prove that that's true. Yeah, yeah, so that's another <laughs> it's so great tough. conjecture. Proof, proof that if you have a consistent theory in ADS, if you do this change, when this R is small, that's exactly, it's, it, it captures this thing in this iter, which sounds, I guess, intuitive to some extent, when we are talking about very small distances, but again, how to prove it, I don't know. No, the issue I had was the, the, the role of the horizon in the decider case that may allow you to do unusual things compared to the other two cases. But anyhow, I, I wanted to see if there was any comment regarding that, but. Uh... Yeah, here I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's the same as uh, the role of, uh, role of cosmological horizon for the experiments at LHC. <laughs> That's the thing. Imagine some EFT at very short distances, and but eventually there is, there should be some role for uh, for a cosmological horizon. Maybe maybe it has some something to do with subtractions or uh, some analogs. Maybe there is some subtraction and you get the contribution from cosmological horizon. So yeah, but not clear yet. Yeah. Hi, um, can I ask um, a bit of a technical question maybe, but I didn't fully understand um, that um, you had derived, uh, so for the black hole case, you needed to assume that the impact parameter was small for it to happen, right? High energies and small impact parameter. But then you were using that the, um, the fastest growth was the maximum linear. And for that, you were using that the impact parameter had to be um, bigger than, so it, uh, maybe I missed something. Yeah, sorry. I, I, yeah, I realized that I didn't explain it properly. So let me try to explain it a little bit better. So the logic is like that. So we start with the twice subtracted dispersion relations, and we show uh, that this is this is true. And here the picture is already that uh, what the smearing does for you it suppresses uh, higher high contribution of high spin partial waves. And uh, so this is dominated by some fixed impact parameter physics. So that's the, the way this bound works. And these conditions come from the imposing that higher spins are suppressed. Now, the, what, the, what, the, what we did, yeah. This is not the big, just before I'm going to my previous question, just to understand this. So this mirroring um, or the fact that you're suppressing higher spin is, 
isn't it similar to saying that they have to be very far apart for the scattering or is it not the same because initially you at the it's, beginning it's you really, said it, it's really this kinematical fact is that if you take a legendre polynomial and you smear it with mm -hmm. this function with decays a and b you see the more a and b are at large mm -hmm. steam they're more suppressed okay Okay. So in the, or in other words, in the impact parameter space, the larger A and B, the faster your support of your wave function and impact parameter decays. So you are considering the wave functions such that the, the large impact parameters are more and more decay, decaying faster. So this is a purely kinematical fact. And now I combine this purely kinematical fact with the dynamical fact. And the dynamical fact is that when you take uh, when you take a scattering at very high energies for B less than R Schwarzschild, uh, you have just total absorption. And now the claim is that if you combine this statement with a kinematical statement, you get that the C is zero. And the way it comes about is that it's a little bit interesting. It comes about is that in the relevant, so this this sum in principle you have here exact f, but you can show that the only f's which can contribute linearly, they come from this region. And so then I just compute what what the contribution is. So okay. you, we just yeah dynamical dynamical assumption is dynamical assumption is really really this. There's a question from Gabriele. Yeah, hi, Sasha. Nice talk. Um, I just, uh, you went very fast. What did you say exactly about the bound in large MQCD? J less Sorry, yes. So, uh, so let me. It looks a little bit weak, the result, if you see. Yeah, that. yes. Well, it is, it is, uh, it is, I'm, I'm, I will not be surprised. Okay. If it's, uh, if it's uh, far from being saturated, so that the result is just this. That let's say, let's say we have something like large NQCD and we have a leading wedge trajectory. You're talking about uh, top top limit, really? Yeah, yeah, planar. 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 I mean, yes. not not large enough. No, no, not uh, not your limit. Okay. Um, so um, uh, we take uh, this leading wedge trajectory. So here's zero. Here's the mass of the light is blue ball. Mm -hmm. So what I showed is that this is less than two. Oh, this is less than two. It's not, the, it's not in the space-like region. Yeah, in space-like region, we can also prove that it's less than two. Only less but, than two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but the, we can extend it to, the, uh, to this. this but region. that would apply for a the trajectory which contains a QQ bar or is the vacuum trajectory? So here it's just the leading register trajectory. So it's, so it's, it's it will be trajectory. probably blue. Probably blue. blue walls. Yeah. I see. Okay. So it's okay. Mm -hmm. Because I think if if you add quark loops, you know, like in the the, the large N expansion I propose, then you can prove a sort of unitarity bound on partial waves because you have a full nonlinear unitarity constraint. And maybe in that case, I had old claims that in that case, the physical intercept should be below one, not below two. But in the planar theory? In the planar theory, yes. Okay. We can discuss uh, it. <laughs> As, yes, there is a, there is a, I can, uh, it's a bit technical. There is, if you assume that the scattering is not purely elastic, mm -hmm. then you can, you can show that it's less than one ah. in the theory. So here, yes, this, this going to two, it's just because I cannot exclude a situation where it's like in gravity, a square, purely elastic. Purely elastic. So if you say that in, within the planar theory, 
the leading rigid trajectory involves some uh, absorption or some it's not purely elastic scattering then well uh, that I, should be less yeah. than one. I thought you could still um, exclude higher than one not exclude one but maybe exclude higher than one but okay yeah, yeah, no less exactly. less or equals than one less or equals than one okay mm -hmm. okay we can discuss it here thanks a lot are there other comments or questions Okay, so I don't see so many thanks again uh, to Sasha for this very nice talk and also to Agnese for the previous talk. Some sound. And in principle, there are virtual drinks uh, now. I will, <laughs> but as usual, I don't know 